Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to the tutorial on vision language models. My name is Joanna Bika and I'm currently a research scientist at Google DeepMind. And as Peter told me a few minutes ago, I should give you a few more details about myself. So I'm originally from uh, Romania where I studied at Tudor um, National High School of Computer Science. I don't know if there's anyone from that high school here as well. Um, and then after that, I went to Cambridge where I studied computer science. And then after that, I did a PhD where I focused a bit more on building machine learning methods for healthcare with the aim of predicting treatment effects for patients based on data from electronic health records. And after I finished my PhD, I decided to join uh, DeepMind and there I shifted a bit focus of research where I started working more on vision language models. And currently I'm working on um, Gemini to improve its multimodal understanding capabilities. Thank you, Jana. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Anastasia Ilic. Uh, I work with Ioana as a research engineer at Google DeepMind. Uh, and I also should give a two minute, uh, more, some more details than just my name. So I'm originally from Serbia. I went uh, to mathematical grammar school in Belgrade. After that, I did my undergrad and masters at Cambridge in information and computer engineering. And right after that, I joined Google DeepMind working as a research engineer. And so far, I've been working together with Iana for the past roughly two years on improving vision language models uh, in Gemini. So today, we will uh, give you a brief. <laughs> Thank you. So today, we will give you a brief uh, like run-through run slides uh, for the tutorial. And then you will be split into breakout rooms to uh, work on the tutorial. Thank you. We also wanted to say that tutorial was also done together with Aishwarya, but unfortunately she was not able to come here today. Okay, so um, as an overview of the tutorial, we'll have it split into three parts. And the first part will be a bit more of a history of multimodal understanding and some background. We'll cover a bit of that background in this presentation now, but if you want more details and more um, explanations about the model, you will find that in the first part of the tutorial. Then we'll have more hands-on exercises with contrastive language image pre-training, a clip on short. And here we look into implementing the clip loss and then trying to do some um, interesting like tasks using clip pre-trained models. And as a third part, we look into fine-tuning polygemma, which is a powerful um, three billion parameter vision language model. Okay, so a bit of an introduction of what are vision language models, and you may have seen this from previous presentations as well, but essentially the main components of a vision language model system involves having um, an image feature extractor that processes the image, a text feature extractor that processes the text, and then these are combined together in a module that essentially tries to align the representations for the image and the text such that then you can use this model to like answer questions about the image or like for image captioning and um, these kind of tasks. And to be able to do this, we have on top of uh, the multimodal fusion, we have a prediction head. And these vision language models are used for a wide range of different tasks. And this can uh, vary from visual question answering, where you want the model to be able to accurately answer questions about the image. This can also be used for um, image text retrieval, where you can use text and retrieve images that are relevant for that text. Or also for image captioning, where you give us input the image, and then you ask the model to like give you a caption that contains the descriptive like representation of what's happening in the image. Now, as a brief history, the way we used to be able to obtain these uh, features to build vision language models was by pre-training large models on uh, data from ImageNet. And this was, these were all trained historically up until a few years ago. These were all trained on classification tasks on the ImageNet data set. And the main advantage of having these pre-trained models was that ImageNet um, is a very large data set and has a wide range of classes. It has like a thousand classes. So that means that you can obtain these pre-trained models that could then generalize to like a various different um, downstream task without requiring um, much, much fine tuning. Now, the issue with, uh, with 
obtaining these image features from ImageNet was that, first of all, you are limited to the labels pre present in this uh, data set, and also like this would not be able to generalize well to other domains that are not in the data set. So for instance, like if you want to look at medical images or like um, satellite images, this would not be present here. So models pre-trained on ImageNet would not be able to do well on those tasks. And then another major problem was also the fact that from classific to solve the classification tasks, this model did not have to like learn fine-grained details about the image in the image backbone. And this was very limiting because then if you wanted to ask about detailed information about the image in the text, the, the visual encoder was not able to extract this just because to solve the classification task, this was not needed. So as a next step, what came uh, in the literature was instead of just pre-training on classification on ImageNet, we also had object detection tasks. So this idea of having models to pay more attention to the object and then be more object-centric in the image representation, this further improves um, what kind of fine-grained information you can have in the models. Now, the main bottleneck of um, all of this, both for like image classification and on object detection comes from the label set. So as I was saying, ImageNet only has like a thousand labels and then the data sets from object detection also have a limited class of labels. So Coco has around object, object, 80 object classes and then this has been expanded over time but still to fully be able to represent the variety of information available in images from in the internet, you need a lot more than this number of classes. So what came as a game changer was Clip, which uh, instead of having specific predetermined labels, instead it can be, it's a model that can be used um, to train on image text pairs where the text pairs are coming from the internet and contain descriptions of the images found on a large scale on the internet. So you no longer had a like a predetermined fixed set of labels, but instead your labels was all of the image descriptions that you could find available on the internet. And Clip proposes a way of essentially using the, this image text pairs that you find widely available and having a loss function that minimizes the similarity between the correct image and the correct text and maximizes the similarity between an image and then all other texts uh, in the batch. And what's very nice about Clip is that after it's be been pre-trained on this large data set, then it can be used on, uh, in zero-shot setting to solve a lot of different tasks that it was not uh, used for. And we'll see this in the tutorial as well. So as the first part of the tutorial, you will need to implement this um, Clip loss. And this will take as input um, a batch of image embeddings and a batch of text embeddings and your task will be able to like implement the contrastive loss. Now note here that you'll not train the clip model during the tutorial. This is not possible to do on a single TPU. Usually you need like a large data set and a lot of resources to be able to clip, to train the clip model. But here in its exercise will be just to implement the loss and then further on um, we'll load pre-trained clip models from Hugging Face and we can play with those. So if you get stuck here, know that like you can move on to the other parts of the tutorial without like without any problems if you don't manage to like get the clip loss implementation right. Um, okay, and then uh, we'll see how we can use a clip pre-trained model. So this will be loaded from the Hugging Face library and I think you've already have some experience with Hugging Face from the previous tutorials. And this has pre-trained image and text encoders for Clip. And then we'll see how we can use this to do semantic image search. So what this means is that you'll have an image collection. And then the idea is to have a text query. And then you will want to like find from the image correct collection the images that are most, like, most accurate for the text query. So this is what you need to implement uh, in this exercise. And if you did this correctly, you should get these two images here for like the text query provided in the tutorial. And then finally for Clip, we'll also want to show a bit of its failure cases to motivate further improvements um, in multimodal understanding. So in the, in the last exercise on Clip, you, you use the SugarCrab benchmark, which is a benchmark that's based on Coco and it has um, images. And then for each image, there's two candidate captions. And the main difference between these two candidate captions is that the object attribute changes. 
So you see here that, he, like, here you have one apple and several oranges, and here you have several apples and one orange. So here it tests whether the model can correctly count. For the second image, you have um, two descriptions. One of them is a blue vase, and then the second one is an orange vase. So here it tests whether the model can correctly understand uh, color attributes for the model. And your task for this exercise will be to, for each image to rank the captions, such that you can see whether the model can correctly identify what's a correct um, caption for each image, and then there we'll dive a bit more deeper into like the failure cases and move on to the second part. Thank you. So in the second part of the tutorial, we will be fine-tuning the PolyJama model, uh, but before we go on to that, we wanted to address also some different types of multimodal fusion and why it's important to align image and text at an earlier stage. So we could have a dual encoder setting where we initially first find the image, uh, the image representation or calculate the image representation and then we have the text representation separately and only then we fuse them together. But we could also train a joint encoder which is something more like PolyGemma where there is more, more fusion happening uh, between text and image uh, embeddings, embeddings earlier in the training process. So if we think of PolyGemma in this input-output uh, framework, we take an image, we pass it through the image encoder, and we get image representation. We then do linear, project, uh, linear projection of the image uh, embedding, and we do text uh, input concatenation with text input and this uh, image input representation. And then we pass that through the Gemma, which is a large language model, in this case a 2B model, that can generate text output. And this, uh, if you think how it compares to Clip, like Clip is still comparing an image uh, and a predefined text. So you fail to generate some more open vocabulary text, and that essentially limits the applications uh, that you could have. In turn, PolyGemma allows for vast uh, range of uh, capabilities uh, here. So we could have image captioning with model like this, we could have visual question answering, we could have detection, and referring uh, expression segmentation. So here is just to give you an idea of everything that current PolyGemma checkpoints can do. So we could have image captioning where you take a prompt, uh, the in this case, just caption the image, and then you can see uh, the caption of the model. Uh, similarly, you could do visual question answering. Some more specialized use cases, uh, such as detection. And the cool thing here is that all you want to do, uh, essentially, is data manipulation. So the setup is the same. Uh, the fine tuning, you can think of it in the framework of prompt um, image, and then at the output you have text. So Anything you want, you could put into that prompt, uh, teach the model to process that prompt the certain way, and learn to produce the desired output. In this case, it could be some specialized detection tokens or some specialized segmentation tokens. So that's cool. Uh, however, if Polyge when PolyGemma is trained on a vast uh, internet scraped data, sometimes it fails to understand some fine-grained details about images. So you might want to fine-tune your PolyGemma model to do some specialized applications that you want your model for. So in this case, if we just take out-of-box PolyGemma, that's been more like a general model. So it's capable, but maybe it's not super capable at something that you really want. Uh, to use it for. So if we take the baseline model, a checkpoint readily available, you could just load it and that's something that you will be doing in this tutorial. And then I just pass this image and the question, uh, you get an answer that's not entirely correct. However, if you train uh, on this data in a, this document visual question understanding uh, way, which is something that you will be doing uh, during the tutorial, you get a more accurate uh, answer of, on this uh, question. You could use any data, and Hugging, uh, Hugging Face has a lot of data sets, and you could even create your own data set. However, for the purposes of this uh, tutorial, we will be loading this readily available doc VQA. And because fine-tuning, it's slightly compute expensive, so we did some fine-tuning uh, for you. You could certainly, if you have available GPUs, uh, do it yourself. Uh, however, you could also load this pre-trained checkpoint that we already trained for, trained for two epochs, uh, and you could do sampling to see the output. 
through this part of the collab, there will be some missing pieces, uh, such as, for example, the optimizer that you, you should use. Um, you could do some different uh, parameter like selection uh, for it. So, however, it's not required that you need to fine tune. So there is a point at which it's totally fine to leave it out. Uh, and if you have compute, fine tune it. If you don't have compute, just load the, track, the checkpoint and answer the questions. Uh, you will work on data preparation for this part of the tutorial. So you will load the data set, you will initialize some data set loaders. Uh, and basically the idea is to get you familiar uh, on how to go from, I have this really cool data set and I want this really cool application for Polygemma to uh, now my Polygemma can solve this problem. Uh, and hopefully that can inspire you to do some other uh, specialized fine tuning uh, later. So small things that you might need to fiddle with in your collab is maybe just changing this uh, first, uh, first cell. Uh, TAs will help you with this, but that's just a, a small note. And sampling from a polygemma model takes time. So if you have GPUs, uh, run on them, the more the better. Uh, however, it's, you, will be able, you should be able to sample even without it. And happy coding. <laughs>